Yeah, well, welcome to the session. Um, I can see that there's plenty of experts in the audience as well, so there is an opportunity for interaction. Don't be shy. I know you're not shy anyway, but feel free to engage with the presenters after their presentation. Um, we're probably all going to talk too long, aren't we? Um, I suspect Canvas, so we, we'll get started. Uh, pleasure to introduce Gabrielle Gasparini, who's going to talk to us about calcified CTOs, procedural challenges, and device selection. Gabrielle, looking forward to hear it. I'm going to talk finally about uh, procedural challenges and device selection for calcified CTO. As you know, calcium is a, an independent predictor of procedural success and complication. However, specific techniques and equipment can be used to overcome the procedural challenge caused by calcified CTO. The first step is to have a systematic evaluation. I mean, we don't have just to look uh, and to analyze the CTO body, but also all the others anatomical characteristics that can affect the procedural success, such as vessel diameter, anatomy of the proximal cap and distal cap as well, the present, uh, the extent and severity of calcification, the present of degrees of tortuosity along the occluded segment, and of course, the length of the occluded segment. Then the second step is to start with the higher support as possible. So the procedural setup, it's very, very important in, in dealing with the calcified CTO. So starting with large and supportive shape guiding catheter uh, could be very useful because they provided a great passive support, such as, uh, for example, uh, uh, the amplats left uh, for the right coronary artery. But sometimes you need some adjunctive techniques such as uh, the use of guiding catheter extension in anti-grade approach. The trap liner could be very useful to increase the anti-grade support and the availability to deliver the anti-grade system. And some other adjunctive techniques such as anchoring technique could be useful to increase your anti-grade support. Then the third step is have the right tools. I have the right tools, of course, we need guide Wires. But uh, of course, in calcified lesion, we, we, we need uh, uh, high tip load stiff guide wires, such as Conquest Pro 12 or more steerable one with high penetration power, such as Gaia Second or Gaia Tur. But these are not enough because sometimes you have to puncture the cap with a, with a stiff wire and then, after puncturing, to perform a de escalation of the wire using a medium tip load guide wires or a polymeric wire or a soft tip load tapered guide wires. So you should have all the uh, different kind of guide wires independently of the severity of calcification. And of course, if it's needed to go retrogradely, also dedicated guide wires for uh, retrograde collateral channel tracking. And in the wide range of the microcatheter, in dealing with calci calcified CTO, uh, it's better to start with the big uh, family of the microcatheters, and I mean uh, uh, the coil base one. The coil base has an internal and external uh, uh, coil that allow to apply rotational uh, movement to the microcatheter to increase the penetration power and the pushability. But sometimes these microcatheters are not enough, so in dealing with anti grade calcification, it could be useful also to have plaque modification microcatheter such as Tornur or Turnpike Gold to achieve an anti-grade crossing. Then small profile balloon in a microcatheter uncrossable lesion like in calcified CTO could be very useful because you can do uh, the wedging technique or the ice breaking technique uh, advancing very deeply the balloon inside the proximal cap or in the proximal part of the CTO segment, inflating, deflating and uh, advancing uh, further. This is to, to try to create some modification of the plaque. This is why it's called also ice breaking technique. But sometimes these techniques are not effective. So you can go on with the next step that it's the granadoplasty or balloon assisted micro dissection that the aim is more or less the same, to create some modification into the plaque to allow the uh, anti-grade advancement of our gear. Then, of course, if you deal with calcium, sometimes you need to perform also some anti-grade and dissection re-entry techniques. So it could be useful to have in your cat lab and not only the device, but also the skill to use the dedicated re-entry device, such as the Stingray or the Recross microcatheter. Then we are dealing with calcium and not only with CTO. So IVUS, it's uh, mandatory when we have to treat calcified lesion because imaging can get, guide us in terms of treatment option between the ablation technique and balloon-based technique. For this reason, we should have in our cat lab at least one of each these technologies, ablation and balloon-based uh, technology. 
The first step is the procedural workflow. I mean, if we are dealing with a, a calcified CTO, maybe we can have some procedural challenge over time during the procedure. So we should always think to the next step in order to find a solution to overcome some procedural challenge that can uh, occur during an attempt to cross a calcified lesion. And I'll show you the, an example of this uh, procedural workflow, meaning this is a, a, a long and calcified uh, uh, chronic total occlusion of the RCA, I started with an anti-grade approach with, a, uh, uh, with an anti-grade wire escalation, sorry for that, with an anti-grade wire escalation starting with the Gaia second, Gaia third, and then conquered Sporotel, but uh, the wire uh, um, progress into the um, and distality of the vessel, but the microcatheter does not. So. Uh, the Corsair does not progress, so I try to increase the support uh, using an anchoring balloon in this uh, 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 acute marginal branch, but it was ineffective. Then I tried to, uh, to perform a wedging technique. No, sorry for that. Okay, to advance uh, a microcatheter uh, for plaque modification such as uh, turnpike gold, but it was ineffective. So I tried to perform a grenadoplasty that was uh, effective in creating some plaque modification. And after the grenadoplasty, I was able to advance just a little bit further uh, the balloon the, um, to perform a predilatation and then uh, followed by 2O balloon. But after that, uh, the turnpike uh, gold was not able to cross. This is, could happen in very long and calcified lesion. The microcatheter, the, the tornus can get stuck, so it's better to remove it and to advance, once you create the, the, the channel, to advance a different one, such as I come back to the Corsair, but to increase the likelihood to achieve the distal vessel, I use a combination of anchoring technique and the trap liner anti-gradely, and then you can appreciate how the microcatheter went into the distal true lumen, and and then I exchange with a rotor wire and perform a rotablation, uh, achieving, I perform a rotablation, a rotablation achieve this uh, uh, good final result. So the last step is to have also a comprehensive approach. That it means that if you can, if you cannot go through, go around. But it will be the topic of uh, James and Camby's presentation. So, Rob, if you have the right tool, you can be successful. Thank you very much for your attention. So, uh, Gabriele, just um, one important question. I mean, the scenario that we often face on is that we crossed with the wire almost intraplaque, but no device can follow. And um, so what's your algorithm for the device on cross lesion? Yeah, of course. First of all, to improve the support, but maybe I already started with the right setup. So with a, a supportive guide or a guiding catheter extension. But if even in this case the, the device cannot cross, I try, as I explained, use some uh, technique with the balloons, ball profile balloon, the wedging or the grenadoplasty. And finally, if all the, the plaque modification microcatheter, but if all of this first line and second line technique doesn't work, I can, um, I can go on with the second line that are, of course, uh, more or less more aggressive. And uh, uh, for example, if uh, I'm not able to advance uh, um, uh, any device um, through the lesion, so we are in front of uncrossable lesion, uh, the, uh, um, a strategy is to uh, engage to, to engage the microcatheter into the lesion and uh, to remove the CTO guide wires that cross the lesion and to uh, try to advance uh, a rotor wire, for example, or a viper wire if you have an orbital aterectomy, and then to perform a, um, ablation technique. Of course, it could be considered as a last bailout, but I'm, I say, if the first wire was able to, to find and to create a channel, maybe your rotor wire guide wires can be advanced through the same channel. But of course, it depends on tortuosity and the length of the lesion. Uh, clear, clear message. So if there are no other questions at the moment, I think we just go on, James, yeah? And, I think uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Given seven minutes, is quite short. Yeah, and uh, if there's time left, uh, left we, can, we can discuss afterwards, okay? Yep. So next speaker is uh, Professor James Spread from London. I hope it's your presentation. 
So thank you very much, uh, Gabrielle, for a great talk. Thanks to Asai for organising uh, this uh, symposium, and thanks to Optima and VP for the slides. So I'm talking about how to deal with long calcified occlusions with reference to a particular case presentation. I think the reason we're in this room and why this topic remains of interest is that calcium remains the significant limiting factor in all coronary interventions. We like to segment uh, CTOPCI up into its own little box, but the outcomes in terms of lesion durability are the same uh, in terms of mean stent area and durability than they are for standard uh, PCI. And the reasons are mechanistic and very easy to understand in that calcific plaque is less compliant than, than normal plaque, so it's less elastic. It's harder to, uh, to stretch it up. In fact, it's not elastic at all. It'll either yield or it won't yield. And if it doesn't yield, you're in problems. Either you can't cross it with a wire or you can't get the stent to the requisite diameter to ensure uh, durability of your procedure. So if you think about how this lack of compliance of the vessel, this non-stretchy vessel, affects outcomes, it pre prevents delivery of secondary equipment, and that's what Gabrielle was referring to when he talked about trying to get microcasters past calcific lesions. It means you have to upskill in terms of understanding what's out there to modify this calcium and, uh, and to, re to improve the compliance of the vessel and as we know, the penetrance of devices such as rotation atherectomy and their use within the CTO space is still pretty small because it's difficult. And ultimately, even if you do cross, if you're not able to modify the lesion to the right level, then you're not going to get the stent to the right size diameter and your stent isn't going to last and your patient is going to get the benefit from the investment of your procedure. And then if we bring that down to the CTO level, well, what's different about calcium in the CTO space, well, we know it's more prevalent, particularly in the post-bypass scenario where it's seen in about 80% of post-bypass CTOs. It's particularly concentrated within the proximal cap, but it can also cause problems in the, within the vessel itself and the distal cap. So if we look at that within the context of a clinical case, this is a fairly typical clinical case. Uh, previous disease, known CTO of a right, had left-sided disease treated. Uh, large ischemic burden, uh, slightly reduced left ventricular function, and also significant COPD, peripheral vascular disease, AF, and reduced renal function. So exactly the kind of case that you should pick for a live case, which is what we did, of course. Um, so this is the setup shots. You've got a really long occlusion of the right coronary artery. You're talking about essentially the whole vessel from the ostium. You can see that there is some uh, faint filling uh, uh, from the septals, but there's a very large proximal vessel. Now, ironically, large proximal vessels that are occluded proximally give you less support because you're, you're, not, you're unable to produce the same amount of force. So what, what we're dealing with here is a very calcified proximal cap, and we're trying to make some sort of... We're trying to compensate for the lack of support because it's a near osteal occlusion in a large vessel. Every time we push, the guide catheter will kind of back out into the aorta. How do we circumnavigate these problems? And, and that's sort of what uh, Canvas was alluding to. You need these algorithmic solution to problems. If you can't push a wire through the cap, what do you do next? Do you change your microcaster? Do you adapt your technique? So this is us trying to make some sort of progress with very stiff wires. And you can take your, your stiff wire of choice here. It was and a STATO 40 to make any sort of progress in this vessel. But despite that, we still can't make any substantive progress beyond the, the, the proximal cap. The problem at this stage is that this isn't a vessel you're going to wire. It's 120, 130 millimeters long. So what you're trying to do is achieve modification of the proximal cap and then switch to a dissection re-entry mode. Either you go antegraded dissection re-entry if you've got a, a possible re-entry zone, it doesn't look very optimistic, or you modify the proximal cap and then you go retrograde dissection re-entry. So what are your options? In this situation, we use something uh, which Mauro Corlino originally described as a way of recannulating CTOs and which we repurposed some years ago as a way of modifying CTOs. Here, you're actually injecting contrast 
into the cap itself. And that doesn't take any backup support. So you can do that and modify the cap without actually requiring a lot of backup. And it can also sort of highlight the vessel itself. And even though it sounds quite alarming, it's actually quite a safe thing to do. And then once you've modified the cap, you're looking to progress rapidly to some sort of dissection technique here with a, a polymeric wire into that space created. So you can see from this still, that kind of uh, shadowing around the vessel is the injection subsequent to the injection. At this point, you've got a, a, a knuckle wire in place, and we're trying to advance the microcaster past that proximal cap. But we're still really, really struggling with backup support. So what do you do here? Well, the next step at this stage is to try and augment that backup support. What you're trying to do conceptually is stop the guide from backing out. So to try and do that, we can do one number of techniques. So initially, we described this scratch and go technique, which, to be frank, is rubbish, doesn't really work, so you can just ignore that. Or this power knuckle technique, where you have a knuckle in play, but you don't have enough support to propagate the knuckle down the vessel, so you essentially balloon trap it proximally. And base is a fairly similar technique where you actually create intimal disruption proximal to the proximal cap, and then you ignore the cap, if you like, you just bypass the cap. So combining this base where you create these intimal disruptions, which happens in all angioplasty, with a power knuckle, you can pretty much modify any cap with any sort of proximal residual vessel. And of course, some of the cheapskates out, here, out there are taking pictures. Those of you with any real integrity would buy the Antigrid Eye book, of course, but far be it from me to, to promote any, any material like that. So you're inflating this balloon, creating these intimal disruptions, and then you're anchoring that microcaster in place and pushing, uh, pushing beyond that. So even, looks, even though this looks quite unpleasant, this is actually success. You know, you're, you're pushing that knuckle past in a way that you can see the kind of vessel course. You can see it aligned with the calcium here. You can also see the near impossibility of wiring a vessel like this. We don't know where it is, huge amount of support required, huge amount of kind of um, tortuosity within the vessel as well. So at this point, the proximal cap is more or less sorted. You want to then go on to deliver a guide extension halfway down the vessel and set up for a retrograde procedure, and that's kind of what we do next. So once I've done the hard yards and the proximal cap, we let column in to do the the kind of polishing work by going retrograde uh, with this uh, initially cyan blue caster and then crossing with the cyan black wire. And then what we're doing conceptually at this point, because we've created all this interval disruption, what we want retrogradely is a, is a knuckle. We want the two wires to be matched in subinterval space. And you're um, creating a knuckle retrogradely and a knuckle antigradely, and then you're using a balloon to deliver uh, a guide extension of your choice to a point where your wire doesn't have a choice. You essentially balloon the tip of the retrograde microcaster, then you advance the wire into uh, the guide extension. Once you've done that, you can then, of course, change for uh, some sort of externalization wire, in this case, an RG3, and then you complete your procedure from that. So from this point, your problems aren't finished because You've still got all this calcium in the vessel that you've got to modify if you want a durable outcome. You've got the sheet calcium proximally, you've got a thin sheet at that point, uh, mark two, superficial calcium, uh, again, near circumferential at this point. And then you've got this very difficult place where you've got subintimal wire passage and calcium outside that within the true vessel. What do you do in that scenario? And that is a, is a, a kind of a real problem. So obviously we put in some stents, but it's not enough to put in stents. What we want to do is make sure that these stents are going to be durable. And durable really means MSA. What is the mean stent area that we can get these stents to? Uh, so we're looking for proximal MSA, proximal edge of the stent, distal MSA. You can see this is a very large vessel and distal edge, but the real crux point around these subintimal cases is your risk versus your reward in terms of optimizing the stent. You're, what you're doing here is expanding the stent in subintimal space. And why is that different from normal stent expansion? Well, rather than applying circumferential force, which is limited in its ability to cause damage, you're actually applying eccentric force because you can't modify 
the true lumen when you're in a subintimal space, all you can do is push it away. And then you're relying on basically that adventitia staying in place. If you push that envelope too far, well, we all know what's going to happen. So you have to be pragmatic in terms of the MSA you achieve. And now we say if you get an MSA or an MLA greater than five with Timmy 3 flow, that's probably good enough. In this vessel, it was a lot larger than that because it was a larger vessel. So I would say, in conclusion, we all know calcium's a problem. It's still the most limiting factor across percutaneous intervention. That actually, in this case, I went through it so quickly, it didn't show you the IVL in the proximal vessel, but that does allow uh, modification of concentric and eccentric calcium. But eccentric calcium remains a difficult problem to deal with, and you're really talking about the acute ability of the vessel to stretch, and you do not want to push that envelope. We don't really have clear guidelines on that other than be sensible. And subintimal stenting and calcium modification remains challenging. And just one point to leave you on is that we did obviously looked at this within the, the consistent study, and we found that if you've got good MSAs, these stents are as durable as they are within intraplaque outcomes. So thanks for your attention. So absolutely great talk, James. So one important question is, so is there a difference f for you, I mean, in your personal strategy, uh, once you, you have an intraplaque or extraplaque crossing calcium regarding plaque modification? Um, I think there is a difference because the holy grail canvas is to modify the calcium when you're not within the calcium. You see the same analogy with PCI. When you have concentric calcium and you're applying concentric force, you can determine has it fractured the calcium or not. The challenge we have both within PCI and CTO is eccentric calcium. So how do you selectively apply that force? You can't do it with balloons because balloons expand circumferentially. They can't differentiate. They'll overexpand the elastic tissue and they'll just push away the calcium. So I think if you're going to look at CTO as a way, as an example, that's, if you like, the ultimate example of eccentric calcium when it's in a separate part of the vessel. It's lithotripsy or, not, or, or, or nothing, and at the present, there's nothing to suggest even lithotripsy is effective in that area. So maybe that's because we haven't looked hard enough. But at the moment, it's, you know, believe in the adventitia and don't push the limits is probably the message. Which means that you probably would not recommend for aterectomy devices in extra plaque? Yeah, and again, there's a lot of misconception around the use of rotational atherectomy in the subintimal space, because actually there is no need within the subintimal space. It's the transition between intimal plaque and the subintima. That's the point where you rotablate. But actually, there is safety-wise, it makes sense. Again, it's selective for calcium. It pushes away elastic tissue. But its ability to modify anything it doesn't touch is zero. Okay. I have another question for you, James, because you mentioned the uh, intravascular lithotripsy. So um, sometimes uh, I well could be useful in some uh, complex reverse card in which uh, you are not able to create any connection ballooning with a standard balloon because the calcium between the two wires represent a barrier. So uh, my question is, the um, lithotripsy can work just if the anti-grade wire is intraplaque to create some um, connection, or even if your anti-grade wire is extraplaque? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. I think we, we did the first report on uh, reverse cart with lithotripsy. So, so the answer as it currently stands, that the lithotripsy needs to be intraplaque to modify it. But again, that's, uh, you know, if, if you're trying to understand reverse CART, what you're trying to do is create intimal tears between the intima and the media for that to work. And it's only going to work intraplaque at the moment. We've tried it extraplaque in the subintimal space, and I think it's just too far for uh, the energy dissipates before it makes proper modification. And I don't think anyone's tried it retrogradely because, uh, well, they're kind of a bit bulky for that. But there's an idea. <laughs> Great. Okay, so we can go on with the next talk from Cambis Masayeki and uh, about uh, 
technical challenges in the treatment of calcified CTO lesion? Please, Cambys. Yeah, which is uh, almost uh, based on, on more case examples. So those are my disclosures, and uh, we'll focus uh, almost on impenetrable proximal cap and intraplaque crossability of the CTO segment. So um, I will give you some, some, also some flow charts. So once you have an impenetra impenetrable proximal cap, um, which means the wire cannot pass, the only opportunity is, uh, sorry, the only chance is that you are going to dissect the vessel. And uh, the one is uh, with the base technique or even retrograde, uh, knuckle retrograde uh, Kalino technique can work. So here, a simple example of this balloon assisted sub intimal entry. It was already attempted multiple times, this uh, integrate cap, uh, even for uh, uh, operators who do a lot of uh, cases. But nevertheless, um, there was no wire could pass this cap. It doesn't look too complicated, actually. But um, uh, I tried uh, with uh, confidence at 12, 14, a SATO 20, but uh, no wire could pass. So, what to do next? So there is a simple solution for it, and I will just show you and illustrate it for you for your next uh, CTO when you have this problem. I took a 3.0 balloon, non-compliant, 16 atmospheres, and what I created is a dissection flap. And then the case is almost done, uh, because here you just have to overcome the cap and um, with a filter XT knuckle. And as you can see here, you have uh, plenty of opportunities to re-enter. One would be an ADR-based strategy with Stingray or retrograde. So, um, this is the, the way where you just can go uh, for base technique to overcome the cap. The other thing is, when you have scenarios like this, um, how, how to dissect this vessel, it is not easy because we could not uh, engage any microcathedral wire antigradely. And uh, here, retrograde um, um, uh, dissection was created. So first, you need retrograde approach, for sure. And here, a very, very aggressive uh, knuckle wire technique with Astato and Pilot 200 worked to create a dissection on the ostium retrogradely. And then we're just puncturing to this dissection plan uh, with stiff wires. And uh, then you have already a, a wire overlap. And uh, you can stand this vessel with a final uh, nice uh, timid-free uh, outflow. And also, the six-month result uh, was not bad with, uh, after six months, as you can see here. Well, this is a little bit more complex, uh, uh, the, the, sh the schematic overview, but once you have a heavy calcified CTO potty, you have to think if you're able to cross interplug with the wire or not. I mean, if you are not able to cross interplug at all, I mean, you should go around, like we've seen, base technique, do a dissection, anti-gradely or retrogradely. But if you're able to cross the wire intraplaque, as you can see here on the left, of the left side here, yes, you're able. Then the question is, can the microcardiot or the balloon follow? If yes, everything is simple, right? You can go for rotor wire, you can go for, uh, uh, for dilatation, whatever you want. But if your wire went down, but your microcardiot cannot follow and the balloon cannot cross, it's exactly that what I asked Gabriele, it's uncrossable lesion. And this is the question he gave me. Well, when you, when you, when you have this scenario, the question is, can the lesion be passed by a rotor, or even nowadays, wiper wire for atherectomy? And if this is possible, you can go for atherectomy. But if no, so you still have only the wire on place, which means there you could go in fiber calcific lesions with a laser, or you can just keep the, uh, leave the wire there and do an external crush, supintimal external crush. And if this fails, well, you have to go uh, to dissect the vessel again. So this is the uncrossable lesion. And by definition, it's a lesion that cannot be passed with any low-profile balloons and with any microcardias after optimizing the backup force and even after attempts of granatoplasty. Well, intraplaque crossing failure as an example. So uh, we all agree this is tortuous, this is calcified. We're probably not able to wire that intraplaque. So therefore, a knuckle wire was placed and uh, finally retrograde approach was uh, achieved retrograde excess and I was controlled reverse cart was planned and you stand around the calcification as you can see here well we always had some concerns in the past does it work in long term uh, uh, regarding long term uh, uh, outcomes uh, but here you see even the 12 months outcomes and they are compelled to the resistant uh, what the resistant data shows us that when you go around calcification as long as your landing zone and your your runoff is good and you have a, a, a great um, a reconstruction of the anatomy of the bifurcation, as you can see here, the long-term result is quite good. So this is a different scenario here with low ejection fraction and also limited contrast use and an intraplaque uncrossable lesion, as you see here. And um, 
and this was a, a, a super selective injection. Finally, a retrograde approach was achieved with a, a retrograde a, a scion black and uh, well, go, just go through this. I mean, um, and uh, what we have here after three cc of contrast is a retrograde injection and uh, already something like a marker. Uh, a, a marker microcathed or marker wire for my anti-grade uh, uh, um, anti system. Anti-grade confiance at 12 into the retrograde carvel, everything is perfect, tip in, intra plug, now go for plug modification. But the problem was nothing could cross. Again, uncrossable lesion. Even if you're inside your retrograde uh, 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 microcatheter. So in these scenarios, you have two options. The one is to go around with a knuckle wire to sec and re-enter, or alternatively, what I did here, I just uh, rotated a little bit, my confiance at 12, I created a little bit of space, and then I did a rotor tip in into the retrograde fine cross. As you can see on the right image, this works. The rotor, rotor wire has a three, about three gram of, of tip load, and if you do a small, very small Gaia tip on it, in these scenarios you can stay sometimes in plug. It's uh, really uh, worth to try it. And then you go for your, uh, yeah, for your rotoplation, you, you do use IVUS, you do stenting uh, with, with a limited contrast, and after some 12 uh, cc of contrast, you give one shot, the case is done here, and it was an interplug crossing. So taken together, the major, uh, major anatomical issues in heavy calcified lesions are the impenetrable proximal cap and the uncrossable CTO body. I didn't focus on the retrograde, uh, uncrossable retrograde cap, which is a different animal as well. But I think the impenetrable proximal cap can be overcome with a base technique or even, even retrograde dissection techniques. The device uncrossable CTO segment, well, there you have to define whenever it's possible to uh, um, bring a rotor wire down or, or wiper wire nowadays, so, and, and, uh, or if you go for integrated dissection entry techniques up front. Thank you very much. Some great stuff there, Cambus. Um, I think the problem we've always had with CTOs is converting what someone like yourself does to someone you know, who maybe does not so many CTOs as you do. What would you say is the most transferable of those techniques? A technique which you've adopted, which is actually pretty easy, but you don't see it used very often. I mean, in fact, uh, what is happening in routine practice, uh, James, is that uh, people start with relatively simple CTOs, almost not so calcified, sometimes calcified, very short segments, and a polymer jacket wire just goes through. And the first question, or the first problem they have almost is how to overcome this with microcatheters or balloons. So this is the first thing that we should learn them, increasing backup, mother and child catheters, uh, anchor techniques, and then also have the right uh, armatorium of, of devices like uh, super low profile balloons. But uh, focusing on uh, uh, Tortures calcified uh, uh, vessels uh, when you're going to attend this. I think uh, wire-based strategies take a lot of time. It's not sure if you can overcome uh, the architecture there and int based on intraplaque crossing. So I think nowadays we are much more uh, open to, um, um, to, to, to knuckle those vessels and then find a solution, distal, on the entry side, which means a stingray based reentry or retrograde approach. So, um, and I think uh, this time, uh, the, the, the transition time to, let's say, jump forward to the next strategy nowadays takes very, very limited, a very short time period for routine operators. So, probably three to five minutes, everything is clear, and then you, then you prepare your anti grade cap and, um, and, and focus on how to reenter. And I think actually the literature is quite misleading on this. Because a lot of the literature came from geographies where there wasn't a lot of calcium and there wasn't a lot of CTO, and there's a little bit too much investment in wire-based techniques. I think the cases you've shown is the vast majority have been solved by dissection and re-entry techniques. Is that fair yeah, to say? Yeah, true. I mean, uh, we all know when it comes up to higher uh, GCTO scales, more complexity, including uh, uh, tortuosity and calcification, that... Um, 
I mean, the, the rate on, on, on uh, detection entry techniques, whenever it will be retrograde detection entry, or integrated detection entry, or combi combination of both, I mean, uh, uh, is going up and uh, wire escalation techniques are going down. And uh, especially even on, on retrograde, uh, um, retrograde wire escalation my, might work in some scenarios. But uh, once there is a lot of tutorial and calcification, uh, you will end up in uh, dissecting this intra uh, uh, CTO segment. <clears throat> Cambis, uh, you show us your case of rota tipping. So my question is, uh, in a different situation in which you uh, you were able to externalize your retrograde guide wires, it could sometimes happen that uh, despite RG3 externalized, you cannot be able to advance any anti-grade gear. So what is your opinion to perform a rot ablation over RG3 guide wires? Um, I personally did not do that. I heard several examples. I somehow uh, almost uh, find a solution um, th uh, to, to overcome. There are plenty of solutions, right? There is a retrograde dilatation nowadays with low profiles with 145 centimeter balloons. There is retrograde uh, plaque modification with microcatheters, anti-grade plaque modification. You can do external crush. You can even put laser on it. So uh, you should overcome this scenario. Whenever uh, I mean, you have best backup. Um, um, but if it's really, a tr I mean, you if it's really so that you are not able. Then I have my two microcatheters, which are in kissing position. I give up, right? Uh, sometimes the externalization as well. And uh, this short, uh, uh, um, I overcome almost with the rotor wire and do a rotor tip in the retrograde. Because there you're almost uh, intra plaque where you cannot cross, you know? I mean, uh, if it's anti grade and retrograde, uncrossable, there are two options. One is that you are intra plaque, a very short calcified segment, or in the transition transition zone of intra and extra plaque. If you release, if you give up the, the RG3, then you will see. If the two microcarditors are, are uh, let's say, chomping away from each other, you're at the transition zone. So you, you have to think about uh, another strategy. But almost, in most of the cases, they stay there. They're inter plaque, they're fixed inter plaque, and rotor wire tip in is very reasonable. OK, thank you. Yeah, and, and that's actually a good point to, to maybe wrap things up on canvas. Often if you get to a point in a CTO case where you're not progressing, you've tried a lot of things, taking a step back and understanding what is the goal of the case rather than necessarily just hammering the same nail with the same hammer can often give you a, a different way to think about the case. And that's a great example of that. So. I'd say in summary, first of all, thanks for everybody's attention. Uh, calcium is something that we still need to keep talking about. We don't have the, all the answers, but I think with the expert assistance of Canvas and Gabrielle, we've taken a small step forward. So thanks for your attention and enjoy the rest of the meeting. <laughs>